It's a great pleasure also uh, to welcome back to the Gardner Museum in its uh, new wing phase, uh, Margie Ruddock. Uh, over the course of the last quarter century, uh, Margie has produced an extraordinary range of built work. Um, she's known for a range of things, but in my own estimation, it's really um, the way that she anticipated our contemporary interests in ecological function in relationship to urbanity. I think that's, among other things, um, something we could say about the center of the field today, but in fact, Margie's work and anticipated over 25 years ago. Uh, you may know of her work uh, around Queens Plaza or a range of commissions between Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York. Um, you may also know her, uh, based on her inter international commissions, a range of work across Asia, South Asia, e East Asia, and I think it's um, widely regarded her living water park in Chengdu, in Sichuan Province, China, is really groundbreaking work, you know, two decades ahead of its time and something that's now thought to be canonical in its own right. Um, Margie's work will be consolidated in a forthcoming uh, monograph, Wild by Design, is forthcoming by Island Press. Uh, March 17th is the drop date. I've pre-ordered my copy. You can get it at Island Press or any of the uh, online retailers. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing that in print. Um, Margie's uh, academic career began um, with undergraduate studies in English literature. Uh, and then following that, uh, she began her professional career working for the Central Park Conservancy at, at a moment that I, I regard as quite central in its own transformation institutionally and really central to the transformation of, of, of New York. Uh, following that, clearly she had an appetite for the field and pursued graduate work across the river at the Harvard uh, GSD. Uh, and over the course of the last two, two and a half decades, uh, Margie's practiced in, in a range of collaborative formats. And what I'm particularly intrigued by is the combination of those collaborative forms and yet the consistency of thought, the consistency of intelligence, the consistency of mind evident in the work. Uh, that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to pull off in built work, even under one format of practice, much less a couple of different uh, collaborations. Um, in, in that regard, I think it's also important to say that her work has been quite remarkable in terms of the just the simple level-headed intelligence that it reveals, a kind of straightforwardness, but also revealing a certain personality uh, underneath. Margie has taught regularly at a range of schools internationally, in addition to in the Ivy League, Penn, uh, Yale, Princeton, and the Harvard GSD. Uh, she, her work has been published widely. She's been recipient of numerous awards and honors. And here, I would simply note, uh, in closing, I'm interested in the extraordinary range of different institutions and organizations from the American Society of Landscape Architects, the American Institute of Architects, the Emerging uh, Voices Award from the Architectural League on the design side, to a range of environmental awards, including the Rachel Carson Award from the National Audubon Society, or the Mumford Award uh, from Architects, Designers, and Planners for Social Responsibility. I think that breadth of recognition for the body of work of the last 25 years is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, finally, in 2013, uh, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award uh, in Landscape Architecture. So we're very, very lucky, Margie, to have you here this evening. Please welcome Margie Ruddick. Um, timer. Thank you so much. That uh, was daunting. <laughs> um, and um, I'm so pleased to be here. And um, I think what Charles is, yeah, was uh, referring to as the sort of anticipating ecological, um, the centrality now of ecological work, uh, now has come to be under the umbrella of what's called wild. <laughs> and um, uh, only in the last five years or so have people start to associate the work that I do with the word wild, and I didn't even plan this. Um, it just happened. And I'm gonna take it, I don't mind. Um, it's a lot better than what people used to call my work, which was uh, quirky, it just <laughs> over and over again. And I'm so pleased to be here at this incredible institution, which also, I, it occurred to me, didn't people always say that the gardener was quirky? And I actually Googled, I mean, it's just legions of references, quirky and fascinating, quirky and this, but coming here and being blown away, I haven't seen this um, addition and renovation, I mean, there's nothing quirky about this wildly curated and thoughtful and beautiful place. So I was um, very pleased to sort of take stock about what it is that I do by being invited here. Um, but the wild thing for me really started um, July 21st, uh, 2011, when Ann Raver published in the New York Times an article about my own uh, landscape in Philadelphia. Um, it was, I like writers who hate white paper, I hate blank slates. <clears throat> when I bought the house, it was just a big green rectangle, and I just had no idea what I was going to do. 
And so I just kind of let go, and it became my own little private reforestation project. But unfortunately, the city wasn't so pleased with this, and they gave me a summons for growing weeds in my front yard, and Anne thought this was very funny, and wrote about it in the New York Times. And I wasn't sure if it was the actual weeds, like still grass, there were some weeds, um, but, or the rhubarb, you know, there was a front vegetable patch, which in a lot of cities also is illegal. So I had to go to the judge and, you know, take pictures of plants and say this was actually intentional. Um, <laughs> but it did make me take stock and think what, you know, I was working on a book at the time called uh, What Are We Doing Here Anyway, which is now turned into this book. But it made me really take stock in what I was doing. And, you know, why were people, uh, I was getting emails from people around the world saying, thank God somebody understands my theory of gardening or my approach. And I realized I tapped into the wild gardening movement and I had no idea that it existed. And so I thought, okay, well, what is it? And uh, things like um, this garden, which is the back of my house, um, where I think like many, many designers, I'm just always sort of towing this line between order and chaos. And really watching what happens. And in this case, um, what we're looking at is a big, fat, concrete pad that I never knew what to do with, or I never really had the energy, you know, coming home to do design. And um, one day, we were digging out for a, a sort of a dry garden and came across all this wissahick and schist, and I just asked the guys to put it on this concrete thing. I said, I'll figure out what to do with it later, and I never did anything with it. And um, then this little crack emerged, and all these weeds grew like a little river of weeds. And just it became something really um, kind of momentous for me in letting things go, and also mixing things up. You know, you can do things in your own house that you can't do anywhere else, like um, just mix up plants and, and, and in, indulge in my kind of um, obsession with yuccas, which a lot of people hate. And, um, <laughs> But the big lessons were just to wait, just to be patient, to, um, you know, don't do something, just stand there, which you can do at your own house. Um, and so I really learned a lot about just uh, waiting and not freaking out um, and letting things happen, um, you know, letting the little uh, river of weeds grow, but then also learning how much work in, actually is involved in managing a wild landscape, it's a huge amount of actual pruning and editing and moving and adding um, to actually do. I mean, I am, like every designer I know, a control freak. And so it's not actually that wild. It's very managed, but it looks wild. So managing growth was also a big, big um, test. And that was when I decided to change the title of the book to Wild by Design and see how can these two things, two sides of your brains, really work together. But it didn't start then, my childhood growing up in New York City, there always was this sense that there was wild places sort of interwoven with very hard landscapes, and I never really had a distinction between the two. Um, I never sensed that there was one or the other, it was very black or white. Um, this is my native landscape, really, a place I call home, the end of Long Island, where I still actually, it is my only real home. Um, and it's a wild, wild, coastal, scrubby, back dune landscape. Um, we called it the Beyond Hampton, because it's after the fancy hedges and everything, and the terminal moraine, and it just goes down to the sort of coastal wash. But even here, I have to say, I was really born and steeped in this landscape growing up, but I was also steeped in the design culture of New York City. Um, this picture is 1950 um, Knowles lead designers. Um, there's uh, Noguchi on the right, and Nakashima, and Saran, and, and this very mysterious woman in the middle was my mother, um, who was a textile designer at Knoll. And sort of the long, little band is, <laughs> I always felt that the long hand of design always reached everywhere, and there wasn't really any distinction between what was designed and what was kind of natural. Uh, then when I decided to go to graduate school, I spent the two years before working at Central Park, as Charles mentioned, and then for the Natural Resources Group in New York City, mapping the wetlands and woodlands and the wild um, natural areas of New York City and uh, Central Park, thanks to David Rosen, who I think is here, um, who helped me get my first job in Central Park. And then two years later, I went to the GSD, and it wasn't that much of a stretch for me to move from that environment to this environment. They were kind of of peace, and I didn't see that there was a massive distinction between the two. Um, I was equally thrilled to be in both landscapes, but when I got to the GSD, I discovered that there were kind of two camps. There were the design people, and then there were the kind of crunchy 
um, eco people, and there was this really thick red line between them that was very, very difficult to breach. And I really struggled with this, um, as did a lot of people who were there at the time. Um, I wasn't the only one for a long time. So, um, you know, 25 years later, uh, we're here as a culture, I think Charles really indicated, that people really can accept and understand that a, the kind of effusiveness and, and also the mess um, of a wild, wilder landscape is desirable and can be really productive and also can be really beautiful. So I think that the whole culture has really shifted toward this. So when I was asked to give this talk, I really thought about, you know, how does my work relate to the mission of this series? And I found this little uh, mission statement that looking at landscape as a medium of design for the social, cultural, and ecological life of the city. So I st um, sort of stood back and said, how does my work actually fit into this series? Did I just turn off the thing? Um, and, you know, of course, a project like Queens Plaza uh, addresses social, cultural, ecological um, levels, but what really struck me in this sentence was the word life. And I really seized on that, and that's, I think, what we're doing. We're making places that are really living and very difficult because they kind of can careen out of control. Um, they're not right, e easily containable, but it's very um, exciting to engage in life sort of bigger than... Um, yourself or than, the, than just the site and really engage in the life of the city. And what I sort of stood back also to think, I think Charles and I were talking before about how um, the fashion has actually shifted so that it's okay to do work that doesn't all look the same. So none of my projects look the same, and I don't think any do, and, um, but each one really looks at the world that we're making, and it looks at the bigger world, for instance, this is uh, University of Pennsylvania, it says, okay, I'm gonna transform this kind of dumb bridge into something a little more um, alluring at night, and how do I actually decide what language to use and how to design it to actually relate it to this bigger landscape? How do you make a world that fits within a bigger world? Um, and then at Liberty State Park in um, Jersey City, how do you, uh, actually do a restoration. I think the previous slide was about you know, reinventing something, and this is actually about restoring a freshwater wetland. How do you actually blur the seams between what you're making? Do you always want to blur the seams between what you're making and what exists there, and how do you actually integrate um, uh, built form into something like a restoration? Um, conservation projects have been thought of as really, really boring um, by a lot of designers, and I find that it's an intensely creative process, and even Choosing how to represent, you know, for instance, the flows of wildlife and um, water and vegetation on a site uh, really uh, starts to drive the design process. Um, so from the very, very beginning, you're making design choices. Uh, and then finally, there are projects where they're just expressive. You're just sort of following an idea about a feeling about a place. This is in Biscayne Bay overlook, um, in Miami Beach. And, I just made a project that's just about water. <laughs> like, it's just about the bay. So sometimes you just do things just because they're interesting and you want to. Um, and the client wants to also. <laughs> um, so I really would like to break down the different things that we do. I mean, people say, I want to go to design school, I want to be a designer. And there are so many different kinds of design. There are so many different things that you do in design. And so I wanted to talk about what I just ran through in a little more systematic way. Um, and about the different strategies and looking at all of the projects that I've done or that um, a lot of them through the lens of the strategies that I've deployed. So like reinvention is a project like Queens Plaza where you just go in and you say this place is a disaster and how do you transform it? Um, restoration is you know recreating connections or restoring something that's been lost. And conservation obviously just safeguarding something precious. And regeneration is, you know, setting processes in motion that are going to kind of take on and create a place that will sustain itself way long after you're there. And then finally, just expression, like the art part of what we do. So to talk about reinvention, Queens Plaza is sort of the biggest, for me, um, challenge ever in reinventing a place. This was this tangle of infrastructure, very, very dangerous, um, 10 lanes of traffic that you had to cross to get from north to south. People were actually killed quite often crossing. And then, you know, Rikers Island prisoners were dropped off in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. with a couple dollars when they were let out of prison. It was a very, very scary place. And um, so the Department of City Planning in New York and EDC hired us to um, 
try to humanize the infrastructure and make it really livable. That was like a big, tall order. Uh, make it safer and make it greener. So there really was a greening component to it. This, we won this project in 2003, so it's quite a long time ago. So in order to do this, you know, you have to go through so many steps. And the first one, studying the site, you know, there's so much to an infrastructure project like this, so many complex layers, it's really critical to spend a lot of time just steeping yourself in the site. Um, and then you have to figure out, like, what is the language you're going to use to really sort of start to enter into the game of this place? And um, how are you going to transform the structure, and how are you going to respond to scale? And I'm going to talk about scale a lot in all projects, because it's a huge, um, critical component. And then how do you actually get down to the level of detail um, when you're doing something so big? Um, we. Uh, Often, I just will throw out imagery, images, um, when we start a project, uh, just to say these are our goals. It's really hard for people just to talk, and I think just to have something to start the discussion. And this was just, what do we want to do? We want to embrace the infrastructure. We want to deal with this really, really obnoxious sound of the train. It's called the screech around the um, elevated. Uh, then the roadbed also is really noisy, so we want to um, help the acoustics. We want to recreate some of the connections that have been lost. And we want to bring in light and, and growth and water. And so then when we really started to work, we developed this diagram saying, well, what would we really do? You know, we want to create these ways of people to move through the site and also for water to move through the site. Um, we want to um, do, you know, raise the grade, which is the best way of actually abating noise. Um, we want to um, green the infrastructure. So this was like the second kind of ideogram, also not real, but getting a little more real. Um, but at this point, Amanda Burden, who was the chair of the Department of City Planning, said, well, um, wait a second. And this was 2005 when landscape design had a sort of an edgy problem. <laughs> and she's just like, just, can't you just make a refuge? Can you just make this green place? So I thought, oh, that would be so great. So we made this. I'm sorry, these are sort of blown up to a little, a little out of resolution. But um, we made, uh, we shifted gears a little bit to make something that was much lusher, and we were given license to do something you're not actually allowed to do very often because, you know, defensible space, you're not supposed to do so much planning, and who's going to maintain it? But, you know, Amanda Burden was kind of like the queen, and so if she said we should do it, then we actually had license to do it. Um, this drawing um, and a couple others that I'm going to show uh, really freaked the architects out in 2006. 2006 was when we started to um, send, they'd say, can you send, you know, send us images for a proposal? And they get this and they say, whoa, this is, I, I don't think we can include this because it just looked like chaos and you know, just like mess. And they're just like, this is really like, not good. Um, and now, uh, however many, you know, 10 years later, you see renderings, you see competitions, and all the architects are showing wild this and that. And so it's taken 10 years for this to um, become you know, the, the style. Um, so <clears throat> there actually is quite a bit of layering in here, I'm going to try to use this, uh, of a very, very intense layering of spaces, topography, all to make all of the different levels of use work. Um, this is the um, sort of head of the park. This is actually uh, Dutch Kills Green, a little uh, two-acre park. And then these are the medians that run down, um, that sort of now divide up what was all just big asphalt running to the Queensboro Bridge and underneath the East River. So this is um, the roadbeds that run through trucks, um, taxis, um, every kind of vehicle. Um, so we actually raised the grade here to buffer that sound and created a kind of a, a wash, a long swath of horn beams that really nestle that in. And then this is a constructed wetland in the middle with a pat walkway through it. And then this is raised. So topographically, we did a lot of stuff. Um, and this is sort of a, a meandering, more sort of strolling um, understory landscape. So you can see how they're sort of um, stacked and layered to really, um, and you can, this is early on, but how the sort of ribbon is starting to emerge. And this guy is sitting, um, you know, 30 feet from a taxi and with the um, elevator right overhead. And he doesn't seem in any way bothered by it. And, um, it's kind of uh, interesting how the acoustical consultants on the project, when we first consulted them, said, you know, you're not going to be able to reduce the uh, noise in this because you're going to need 100 feet of, of planted buffer in order to reduce the noise or um, raise the grade and you just don't have that much topography. But the Landscape Foundation did a post-occupancy study and found that the noise level was reduced by 23%. 
just, I think they're not really accounting for the fact that like um, a sponge for water, um, all the plants are acting as a sponge for noise also, and it was not in their book, their rule book. So it's become rather than, it was somewhere above Times Square but below an airport before in terms of obnoxiousness, and now it's somewhere around a Soho street, like a busy street but a Soho street, which is way more livable. And you can see here the sort of banding of, you know, the trains overhead, cars, trucks, and buses, and the bikes, all within a very, very small space. But, you know, you feel safe, and you feel, um, like, entitled to be there. This is not a bounded park space that really leaks out into the city, and this kind of project is really interesting because, you know, where does it begin and where does it end? And um, we actually had to look at the language of traffic you know, striping and say, how is that going to intersect and how do we make a graphic language here with, um, that actually will feel as if they actually part, are part of the same place. And so everything is very simple and white and stark, uh, not white, but sort of concrete, and um, working with the curves where we popped up the curbs to three feet also. Um, that this is later on as the steel is starting to rust, but um, so that that really buffers the sound of the roadbed. And you can see, you know, it's such a tiny space, but it really does feel like you want to ride your bike to work. I mean, it's really changed the way people commute in and out of uh, Manhattan. So this is what it looked like before. It's just like a sea of asphalt, and the infrastructure just looked like it was going to fall down at any minute. And um, this was the view that um, Marpilio Pollock, the architects, uh, urban designers who were our collaborators, studied uh, that structure itself really, really rigorously and found that there were these kind of overages of structure where structure, where elevated had been removed. And if you just lit them from within, put scrims, you would actually create these uh, kind of glowing lanterns that would completely transform the site. This hasn't been done yet and I feel it's not going to be complete until this is done. It's very complicated in terms of who owns what and how they would get this done. Um, it also really improved wayfinding, because whereas before it was just all of those verticals and just a tangle, now you see the gaps and you kind of see where you want to move. So it really did clear it up quite a lot. So this is what it looked like soon after construction at night. This is what it will look like um, once the rooms are built. The scale of this was so immense, and how do you actually respond um, to a scale like that? So the actual structure of the space had to be pretty tough, even though it's very wild and sort of, you know, soft. Um, the actual pathways and the sort of, we did these big axes of um, walkways, had to be kind of like tough to stand up. Um, we also made a very thick um, walkway system where you actually read the relief, working with Michael Singer, the artist, on um, all of the details, kind of scoring along the edges and on the benches. Um, because we just felt that you wanted to feel that the walkways were like infrastructure and it wasn't just a, like, a, like a shell. Um, and so it really makes you feel that the landscape really can stand up to the scale of the infrastructure. And then also we just had to um, figure out the proportion of paving with planting because if you kind of overdid the paving it would feel like the planting is just kind of token. But if you overdid the planting it might feel like you're sort of like in a pretend uh, wild place. So how do you make it feel like it's of the city and of a piece? And this is looking down into the wetland. Um, that detail, which Michael Singer developed the whole scoring system for, was, you know, we wanted to keep people from actually um, riding their bikes or in a wheelchair uh, falling into the wetland, but we also needed to let the water out. So this little gap lets the water out while the curb actually acts to, as a stop. And this was developed actually in Michael's, this was really unusual that they developed it in their studio and they actually built it in their studio and they got the city to commission them as the subcontractors and boy did that make a difference to have the artist actually doing um, the work himself. And uh, this shows you how the water actually goes through. And then the pavers, we designed a system where you could butt joint them where there's a lot of traffic and then you can actually leave bigger joints where you want plants just to grow um, and actually it started. Um, this is one of the pavers, this is a weed, um, several kind of interesting plants that um, grow in there. And the maintenance, very, very skilled maintenance is required for this. And sometimes I go and like everything looks like lollipops in there and I'm like, what's going on? And the maintenance has changed and somebody hasn't been trained in how to kind of leave things. Uh, but, um, you know, do healthy pruning. 
Um, this is the no-go zones where we didn't want people to walk under the structure, and so we took all of the concrete that was pulled up from um, dem demolishing the roads and the streets um, and sidewalks, put it on end, kind of packed with yuccas, surprise. <laughs> um, and they're just such an amazing plant, you know, from around the world, they are so adaptive. And um, so as they grow, this is sort of early on, but as they grow, this place really starts to beef up and start to feel like it's um, of a piece with the um, infrastructure. Um, I think all of our projects now, you just have to really focus on how they perform as environmental systems, environmentally. <clears throat> so in this case, the wetland um, was intended to take all of the water from the street and filter it, and, and the park, and filter it through this little device. Solids would uh, settle out, and then the water would actually filter down, um, recharge groundwater, overflow down into the sewer system. So we, it was the first pilot project in the high performance infrastructure guideline um, project in New York City. And so we really wanted to perform, but there was a little bit of a problem. Um, it does, I mean, you can see that it works, but it's only filtering the water just from the park and not from the street because we um, encountered something that you always encounter on these big infrastructure projects, which is that there's no one landlord. I mean, no one agency or um, authority owns the whole thing. So we did this little map of the players. And, um, you know, DOT, the streets, Parks Department um, controls all of the green space, but streets actually controls the paths and the, and the sidewalks and DEP, the gutters, and MTA, the train. And so who was going to, you had to say to get approval to design this and, and detail it, who was going to actually maintain this uh, TerraClean hydrodynamic separator? And everybody said, not me. And, you know, when you look at this section, you understand why. You know, why would the Parks Department, um, why would the Parks Department over here maintain this when it's taking all the water from the street? It's just uncontrollable. So we fought and fought and fought, went to a million meetings, and everybody was like, you forget it. And so finally, I was so frustrated that I um, did something really, I, I cornered this guy at um, <laughs> New York City Green Coats meeting. This is Rit Agarwal, who is like the czar of sustainability in New York. And I was so frustrated, so and I was like uh, going to these meetings for free. And so I said, Wait, while I'm here, I have this problem, you know, with TerraClean hydrodynamic separator. And his hands went up <laughs> like, um, you know, like, uh, don't even start. And he said, you know, you, you have to talk to DOT. Well, we've talked to, you talked talk to Parks. We've talked to Parks. He said, I'm really sorry, I can't help you. Because I thought maybe I was the 800th person who'd collared him in the last week trying to get him to help them on um, their project. So, I mean, poor guy. So we gave up. The drawings were due. Six months later, I went to a gala at the Municipal Arts Society. And who am I seated next to but Adrian Benepe, who happened to be the Parks Commissioner. We'd gone to Parks, and they all, high up in Parks, and they all said no. And, um, you know, we're talking, and he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine, but, you know, we had this one problem <laughs> <laughs> with the TerraClean hydrodynamic separator. And he said, listen to me, he said, isn't that something you just, he's a really practical guy, isn't that something you just back up a truck every couple years and, you know, clean it out? I said, yes. And he said, well, we'll do it. I was like, oh, God. It was way too late by then, it was all done. But you know, it made me think, well, you know, we really have to know not just like the people, like you have to have people on your team who really not, you know, they don't know just the people on the organization chart. Um, they know really who to talk to and what level to talk I could have called him up and it just never occurred to me that he would say that. Um, he was a, a park ranger when I was working in Central Park in 1983, so we've known each other for a very long time. But it also, you know, maybe tells you what parties to go to. So. <laughs> I don't go to enough of those. But you know, it is it works and it's transformed Long Island City. It's a livable place. Now people are there all the time. Kids are there, uh, senior citizens, um, people who work there. It's a it's a appealing place um, to be, whereas it was really a nightmare before. So I feel like it's um, incomplete as it is, uh, it actually works. There's a lot of restoration in that project, but I'm gonna focus on some projects where it's really in the foreground. Um, in we actually won the competition um, to design the uh, Capitol Parks in Trenton, New Jersey, and really restore the connection between the river that had been lost. Um, this went very, very far um, into phase one CDs, and then a politician named Chris Christie became governor. And this was not on his agenda at all, so it was scrapped. But um, very sad, in this case. But um, it was a project that really was about restoring the city to the Delaware. 
um, and then Delaware back to the city, and um, moving this uh, raised elevated highway inboard. Uh, we wanted to keep these spans of the existing um, roadway. And this is the mouth of the Assunpink Creek, and really restore that as a kind of a estuary riverine, which, by the way, would require massive, massive armoring. <laughs> There's no way you could just build this as a natural thing. But you really would be restoring the feeling of it as an estuary. Um, and this um, sort of restoring rivers, uh, the project that Charles talked about in Chengdu, uh, I went in 1996 on the invitation of Betsy Damon, who was an artist who had been there for several years. And she was doing all sorts of installations that had to do with water quality. Um, and she was engaging a lot of Chinese artists. And they did a number of performances that, um, like this one, which was called Washing Silk, that really brought attention. And I'm going to talk about the role of artists in really refocusing people on natural systems and also events and um, disasters. And so she was doing this, this one. They went into the river. They were sort of highlighting how you, they lost the way of living in the river. So they went into the river to wash silk, which is something that they stopped doing a long time ago. And they were wearing um, hazmat gloves. And the whole performance was seeing how gray, gradually, the white silk turned. And it actually made the city uh, want to commission a park that would show how water is cleansed biologically. That would be a demonstration because they got uh, so engaged in this. So she was really instrumental in, in changing um, this whole place. So it's a series of um, spaces that show how water both can be cleansed by settling. So the water is pumped up into this pump house. It was very much a collaboration of city architects, landscape architects, scientists. Um, and I was there just for a month to kind of mobilize the team, select the site, and do the schematic design, and then I left, um, which I think was a good thing in a lot of ways. Um, it was really developed sort of on the ground in Chengdu uh, from that point on. So the water is pumped up into this flow form that Betsy Damon designed. It spins the water around. Some people say that it changes the um, molecular structure of the water. When I, before I went, I called up Michael Binford, who'd been my hydrology teacher, at, um, and I said, do you believe that this can, he said, absolutely no, this is complete. And I just decided, I don't really care. Um, you know, they're really fun, and kids love them, and um, so the water gets cleaner before it gets into the sailing pond. Um, then they go, the water goes into a mass of constructed wetlands where the plants actually pull the contaminants out of the water, and the local microbiologist handed me this diagram, and um, that was what we used to decide what depths we were going to make the various pools. Uh, this is another uh, image that freaked out the architects. Um, Stephen Harris, who's my close, close collaborator and friend of you know 25 years, saw this and he said, oh God, this looks like lava. This is horrible. He said, this is such a fascinating project, it's too bad you can never publish it. So it's so funny now that it actually has um, been around quite a lot. And it's, um, you know, now it's not just a demonstration. It's a, it's a park that's a real refuge. In the city of, you know, now 14 million, 15 million people, it was 9 million people when I was there. So it's really just um, very much they wanted it to feel a part and feel like a refuge and very much not in the city. Um, the universal plants that you saw in that diagram are, you know, invasive species that we try not to use, like water hyacinths. And, um, cattails and here because they're contained and because they're the survivors that really can metabolize um, the heavy metals, for instance, they're, they're the real workers uh, in this park. It's grown up unbelievably um, in, well now it's, you know, a long, almost 20 years, but um, kids spend hours and hours at these places where um, it's kind of mesmerizing what happens with the water and the creatures, so it really is a place for um, kids and this is another one of the flow forms um, and really, kids, you can see, I think this kid was there for, you know, 45 minutes just in this one spot. Um, here also you can see how permeable paving, you know, the water actually can um, percolate down and recharge with, and really slow down the amount of water. So that's just a lesson in how to slow the water down as it goes to the river. And the local architects got very, very engaged. Um, one designed the pump house, which actually is a tea house, very, very popular, that is on the first slide. On the right, this is a, just a detail for aerating water. Just, I think, a beautiful little sculptural, uh, I don't want to say Scarpa-esque, because when you relate somebody from another country working internationally, and you say, oh, that's like so-and-so, it's very demeaning. So 
it's very much like this particular architect in Chengdu. Uh, and then um, also the local horticulturists did a massive, massive job um, doing native plantings at the first park in China to showcase native plants. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, so this is, um, this is the uh, pool where the water is finally clean, and it really is a refuge and people love waiting in it. it. It's become a place, this whole park is a place where people you know, take wedding pictures and it's a, a community place really. It also, um, my job partly was not to do what I think they expected me to do, which was to come in and do a modern western park. We spent the first week touring around Chengdu parks and we looked at the way they've used Riverstone for you know, eons and I said like, why not do that? It's cheaper here anyway. And they were sort of amazed and then they really, uh, ran with it, and I think part of my job in re restoration was also just restoring traditions that somehow they didn't feel entitled really to keep using because of current trends. Um, I'm starting to talk about conservation with a project that actually has no conservation in it at all. It's completely made up. Um, this is a house compound in um, Cabo, San Lucas, and Baja, California, and um, it's, uh, it was a scalped site ready for construction. However, the project to me is really about conservation because this is a very, very precious um, landscape where I mean, the whole of this area of Baja is one of the, I think, eight places in the world where the desert meets the sea. So I was just really interested in saying how do you actually engage that as a really uh, precious phenomenon. Um, so we brought the kind of way plants grow in the desert into the courtyard of the site. Um, and it wasn't just, a lot of people at the time were getting really interested in using um, native desert plants, but they were using them formally, almost like English gardens with big swaths, and then they would mulch with gravel. So that whole matrix of, of the ground plane is where life happens. So we wanted to, we actually went into the desert um, quite often and just counted how plants kind of occur in this very idiosyncratic way and started to replicate, map that and replicate it and sort of brought it in uh, and just try to have that sort of um, richness in the landscape. And then things like, you know, a green roof over, this is also with Stephen Harris. He's not the only architect I work with, but um, he is wonderful and um, game. And so this was a uh, um, green roof but we did a brown roof. It was a desert roof, over-occupied space. Works just as well and does keep the flow of inside and outside. Um, and then, you know, talking about making whole worlds, you don't, it it's, requires a lot of detail, a lot of calibration. So in this case, <clears throat> you know, all the water's flowing down under that wall, uh, the bottom of the wall and underneath the paving. So rather than breaking with a trench drain, you know, like a little metal trench and, um, we actually just popped the mortar out to allow the water to go down. And um, even things like the paving, where we wanted the new paving to run around existing rocks, uh, you know, we poured in place rather than laying, so it really would feel flat. But we also tinted the concrete, because if we actually used concrete sort of um, native, it would be really white or gray. And so we made it this kind of rosy color to blend in with the stone, and that's actually native sand from the area that's used as to stabilize. The whole um, is a procession, series of moving in and then out to the view, so you, internal and then out, very Olmstedian. Um, sorry to say, we do this all the time, it's just like the procession of opening out to the view and then an internalized space on um, the courtyard, which really does feel set apart. I think views are overvalued in a lot of ways. You know, having places that are actually apart from the view make the view much, much more um, enticing. Um, so then you're launched out over the ocean um, and the pool. That whole, um, that whole cliff, um, we had to actually wire all of the rocks together so that the construction wouldn't, uh, you can see that they cracked, and then we kind of packed the whole um, hillside uh, with plants to really, really bring back um, the kind of, also just wildlife. It's been, you know, from very early on, uh, filled with orioles and uh, other birds. Um, so rather than the obvious, you know, infinity edge, I wanted to make the pool something that you would actually go see above and then go into, and then at the end of it, you're kind of launched out. You can see there's a, a upper wall to relate to the roof of the building, and then the lower one is sort of stone to be, feel like it's part of the cliff. And then, you know, you get to the end, 
and you feel like you're out, you know, you can put your arms up and you feel like you're in the ocean and the whales are migrating in February and March. And it's just uh, pretty heavenly to feel so much like you're in the landscape. One of the things when, you know, trying to figure out what it means to do wild landscapes, I, I'm sure that's gonna be over very soon, but in any case, um, it's a very immersive quality. It really feels like you're in it. It doesn't feel like you're looking at it. It's really, it's really the feeling and experience of being in the landscape, and I think that's something that I aim for a lot. Um, a project that I've been working on for 20 years in the Western Ghats of India um, is uh, much, that was like a quarter of an acre. This is 2,500 acres of very, very uh, diverse forest. Um, it's a bowl. Um, containing this very, very intense forest, <clears throat> and then um, many other kinds of landscapes. It's uh, very, very diverse in terms of the, the landscape types. It's really, really inundated in the monsoon, and it's very arid in the summer. It can get up to 110 degrees, and it, so the conditions are, are very challenging. Um, this is actually an aerial. I never did a plan for this, like a fancy plan because I just sort of felt like it was going to look really ridiculous. Um, you know, the, like, how do you represent this landscape? And I always wanted to see all of the uh, forested areas. So we just drew um, a kind of a, a line in the sand here saying, we're going to keep all the forest intact, and we're going to aggregate, we're going to disperse the program, 100 rooms and all these, you know, spa and, um, and an institute, which was sort of the heart of the idea of the place. Um, we're going to disperse it in the disturbed areas of rice fields and then these very eroded slopes which had been um, cleared for grazing. But these, this is sort of the array from the very, very top where you feel like you're in the sky um, and then the forest. The, the foreground actually was on this side of the line in the sand and that actually was the eroded slope and we spent um, like 10 years really revegetating all of that <coughs> uh, to create new forest. And then looking down at the rice fields, very, very rich because there was a lot of erosion, so this was very, very good for farming. And then the main Nala or waterway, there are like 58 different little tributaries, but this um, actually goes dry by November, but you know, it's rushing water in August and September. So this is what it looked, those slopes looked like when we got there, very eroded grazing, also slash and burn. Um, those practices were, were stopped, but we also started a nursery and planted hundreds of thousands of uh, small seedlings. Um, and the resort architect had wanted us to build like jungle rooms. We said, well, it's not really jungle. But the other thing is that, um, the other thing is that uh, we had this no-go zone. So we said, okay, you want sort of forest rooms. So we're going to grow the forest to meet the rooms, which we, luckily we had time to do this. Time not because they gave us the time, because everybody was fighting about how, how they were going to fund this and how they were going to build it. It took a very, very long time to figure it out. So we had the time to um, redo the forest. And then the whole spa zone is in the um, disturbed area. There's still rice fields in uh, farming, but um, we actually used a, a number of these for the spa. The sense of scale here was so important because you think it's huge, but Stephen was really worried that the minute you start putting buildings in here, you're going to blow out the scale. The roofs are going to look so dumb, and you're going to see all of a sudden it's going to miniaturize this landscape. So he and Tom Zook, his associate, developed a language of roofs based on the village. This is um, looking down at the village in the monsoon, where the roofs are faceted, and it's amazing what it does to break down the scale and it does something to make these. This is these are the spa villas. To they sort of move and it really engage and and animate the landscape, and they're just very beautiful buildings. put a lot of them in here because I love them. This is the forest suite, and you can see the forest has actually grown up to meet the suite. There wasn't really forest before. And then there's the village guest room, which are, it's much more grounded um, in the earth. Um, we domesticated plantings. I don't know if there's anybody from India here, but there's Tulsi in front of every door, um, and it really feels much more like village houses. And when you, you know, we kind of cut down in the ground to enter, so you really feel grounded rather than the forest suites which are flying. And all of these, you know, I didn't do very much landscape that anybody would point at and say, oh, you know, somebody designed this. And um, because it was the siting and just the approach for each one of these landscapes to bring out the qualities that was so important. So I didn't really feel called on to do anything 
signature, as they say, but I've been there over 30 times. I, I was there for most of, a lot of the planting, and um, it's a very, very um, rich project. Uh, this is in the dry season. Uh, that's the club, the kind of heart of the place, and um, you know, social life, and then this is uh, during the monsoon. Uh, looking out from, at the ravine from the club, and then back from the ravine. Uh, sighting just a plane for the pool down in the rice fields. And then high up, a water feature that rather than being flat, it actually has relief and actually feels like it's um, on an edge. So it's very subtle um, things, but pretty engaging. Um, this is actually um, the, the institute, and I have to say, uh, the institute we envision is a place that was going to um, be for promoting sustainable development. But I've come in the last, um, and the last, I don't know, number of years to really look more toward how culture, the arts, really are so much part of um, conservation. That you, you actually, when you look at all of it together, the science, the, that it's much more productive. And we've started a foundation called the Schillen Foundation. I don't know if Martin Brody is my co-director is here somewhere. Um, and we're doing the first programs this summer, uh, which bring together dancers, choreographers working on a project, um, composers, uh, and also um, a painter. Um, they're all just doing their work, um, but we're all doing it together. At the same time, we're having a workshop on conservation, and we're just going to see what happens with sort of the cross-pollination of all this. Conservation thing is going to be very pragmatic, kind of a manual for um, private landowners who have large, large tracts. There's no rule book for how people actually do conservation of um, private, large, large, like Ted Turner, you know, 90,000 acres. They go and hire E.O. Wilson to do their analysis. It's like really crazy. So um, anyway, that's uh, what we're doing. And I'm really excited, not just about, you know, all of the work, but also doing things like taking a walk up to this. Um, this is the uh, um, spiritual retreat, which doesn't have a building on it. Um, Stephen and I had a big fight. We always talk about this um, because, of course, the architect who, what architect would not want to take this on as a place to design a building? And, and uh, he would do a most amazing building that just you know, came, grew out of the landscape. But I just felt like it needed to be empty. You needed to just go up there. And once you bring food and you know, bathrooms, I thought it would be over. Um, but I won. But um, it was not on the merits. It was because the clients just couldn't figure out. I mean, it was just too small um, access, really, to be able to get construction materials. So this is the place now we take two-hour hikes. There's nothing there. I'm going to go there with all of these other people who are working, and we're going to see what happens. Um, regeneration, I'm just going to breeze through um, all the strategies for regenerating a place to really take on a life of its own. And at Shillam, it was, you know, what do you do with people who live there, 100 and something people, and then the various villages around, and a lot of kind of eco resorts come in and just blow out the local community and culture. And so we started by making projects, doing the nursery, and all people in the village started to work in the nursery and also started to really contribute on what they know about growing in these really rough conditions. And we trenched thousands and thousands of linear meters of contour trenches to slow the water down. That was for the uh, revegetation, but it was also provided this um, huge uh, workload for the people who lived there. And it's had a huge impact on how much water flows down. It's really slowed the water down and made all that revegetation possible. This is the nursery, um, which also has really transformed the way people live here now that they are not able to farm the way they were. And the other thing that we did was um, we built this little campground with huts, and in 2002, once we started to go there and stay there, the people from the village were working with us, and we all started to hang out together. So just figuring out social space was a key in engaging the people in the village and having it be their place also. But what really changed things, and I actually was really worried, I said to the client, you know, don't you need to kind of present what you're planning to do? And he's like, he does a lot of eye rolling. Um, at me, and so he said, he's, we're really close, and he said, just, you know, wait, don't worry about it. And so first we had the, the huts, and we had started to really, um, you know, people had a lot of jobs, and they started to slowly learn what we were doing. And then the people who were um, planning and designing the nursery, who were all uh, from India, but not from um, this area, they, they decided to um, do a project with the people in the village and build a new dam that would bring their water source uh, about 100 meters closer to the village. So they did it all together and that kind of sealed it. 
after that, it was a team. And um, so I really got to know this much more organic process of community building where you're not going and telling people what you're going to do. You actually are um, engaging in, in something together. Uh, and leveraging um, knowledge. This woman, in the heat of the summer, can, when there's no water, she can dig down four feet and bring out land crabs. And we've had many incredible dinners um, when it's so, you know, like 104 degrees. And I just think the idea that you can learn lessons here. You just go there to be in the landscape and to learn about what we call subsistence living. That's not such a bad thing, you know, to know how to live with very, very little. And it's something that would be a good lesson I mean, for me in particular, and everybody, I think, uh, in our culture. And um, to move to New York, where this lesson is particularly, um, I think, germane. Uh, <clears throat> this is a competition to regenerate, redesign Governor's Island. We actually lost. I, I like talking about losing competitions, too. And um, uh, so we, we were one of five submissions. And we did, this is very smart planning on this, complete competition loser to do, be smart. And um, we had no real, we got really interested in how, how to do this. And I think I got kind of carried away with the planning where we thought, OK, we're going to do these sort of nested landscapes farming on top of all the new development. So we added 20 acres to the park just by putting farming on green roofs. Um, this sort of nested you know, recre meadow recreation is existing in LA. And then uh, using all of the fill from um, all these demolished buildings that they had to, to create topography here and a ravine and a sort of freshwater wetland. So you know, we created all this new parkland, um, leveraging developers not just to pay for new uh, park, but actually to build it was kind of interesting. So this way, uh, uh, they would build it over new, whether it was uh, light manufacturing or artist spaces. And then down at the ravine, you know, a place where you actually can be sheltered and you can actually kayak. Like you can't dare go into the currents um, around Governor's Island. And, um, and also a place where you could have camps for kids, the kids who can't afford to go to the Hamptons. They could actually have a place where they can be at the, uh, um, the sea, basically the harbors. Uh, so this was uh, leveraging of the resort, like an Amman or something, to say, okay, well, you don't have to design a fancy building. Build all this topography to make this ravine, and you'll probably save the same amount of money, but this will create a whole park space on the side that it's okay for them not to have total privacy. So that was really fascinating to me and has driven a lot of projects and how do you kind of create the system. Um, and here, where Lake Ontario Park, which um, we, this is for a proposal um, for the commission, we said, well, they didn't know how much money they had. It's flat as a pancake, really, really windy. So why not try a kind of a modular system here where you just make craters and you create dunes, people to run on, um, also shelter from the wind. So these depressed spaces, you can fill them up with whatever. So they could be parks with you know, lawn and trees and picnics, or they could be much more ecologically rich little wildlife sanctuaries. And that was something that I um, had uh, the incremental sort of organic approach. I think at some point you have to have a very strong design lead who then says at some point, you know, enough craters, we got to move on. So you can't do these things without curating, without really, really understanding where it's going to take you. Um, final topic is, um, or the final strategy is expression. I, I leave it for last because, not just because it's, not because it's the most important strategy, but really because it is uh, I think the thing that drives a lot of us um, and that is sort of woven through all work, I think it sort of feeds into everything we do. And um, one Bryant Park, that, um, Bank of America, uh, the Durst organization, asked us to do something that was, quote, natural in the green space for the first lead platinum building in New York. And it was like, it's a tall, skinny interior space and um, you know, very little light. Everything's going to grow like sideways. They wanted something that you could walk under that was green, so we thought, okay, it just has to be vertical green. And I thought, you know, what vertical green spaces are there out in nature? And I thought of the fern canyons of um, Humboldt County in California. And so we just thought, we'll take that as our inspiration. And we did um, develop this series of sculptural um, pieces that were all fabricated by Mosaic Culture International in Montreal, and they were then um, shipped down within a weekend down to um, New York. And it's, this is right after construction, it's 
really a refuge. People always tell me my blood pressure goes down when I go in there. It feels humid in a good way. And um, also, you kind of, the scent of earth and ferns and stuff really has a physical effect on your body. And I love this picture because this guy is the kind of guy you'd see, you know, always on his phone or something. And here he is just like sitting. And that's something that I, I think is a real goal in the work that we do. I think talking about the museum as a refuge and respite, it's just something that's so precious and valuable. Uh, and this project, which is the water garden, um, this is actually what it looked like before. And I was asked to do a garden. And I just thought, this is going to be ridiculous, like a little garden with this backdrop of the bay and Miami. So I just said, you know what, it's just all going to be water. I'm just going to flip through these. But water just becomes different planes of water. Made these very dense gardens that you walk through on either side to then open out to the water. Then you look back. It all has a feel of kind of like almost the holy land, you know, that kind of warm, warm stone. So. Um, the planting thing here, these, these are uh, is snake plant. I love using plants that are reviled. You know, this is the dentist plant. And here, I, I just thought, let's just see what happens when you put it in this amazing little spot. And then look, this is a little uh, Venetian moment. It's kind of a wild building in its own right. But here, we crushed up the coral from the um, pavers that we tore up to actually create this so that it would all feel of a piece. There goes the snake plant. Uh, but I was surprised this project was supposed to be about water, but really what it turned out to be, and this is also what happens in art, you know, you start out to do one thing, but it takes you, your roles and everything take you someplace else. It's really about sky. The sky changes by the minute. And this is a mesmerizing place just because of how you see the reflections. This is like 10 minutes apart. So, very interesting Fantastic to have a client who's really engaged in the process and who joins the game. This client, um, after we finished all that, he went shopping. <laughs> he said, I just happened to buy a piece of art called the Lunar Lander. And we're like, oh, God. But in fact, I had to re completely rethink the front to be big and um, jungly, um, just to like, accept this big thing. But it also is about the sky, because the artist um, tints the, uh, that the, um, skin of that so that the glow is the same color as the moon at that latitude at that particular location. So they're all, all of this work is different to be. So this, the front turned out to be about the sky, thanks to a client who um, really entered in a dialogue. And that's pretty exciting. Then the final project is um, the Coney Island Aquarium. And I was invited in 2007 to do a landscape project, um, which was to rethink the perimeter, which was this. It was just like a bunker. Nobody knew the aquarium was there. And I was, thought, that's great, but I really think that this needs an architect. I mean, it really needs to have structure and light. And so I actually Googled structure and light, and I came up with <laughs> an architect I already knew, but uh, Enrique Ruiz Jelly in Barcelona. And he came, and we did this project together. This was the um, first diagram. It was a very collaborative project. He developed this structure, but we did all of the research together and worked in each other's offices. And it really was the kind of project that's so exciting to see how something like this does kind of develop organically. And this was a diagram saying, OK, this thing's going to float. It's just going to be ephemera. Um, and then they're going to be, it's funny that this is not exactly horizontal, but the horizontals um, are actually going to sort of feed into it. Um, and you're going to have a much, much bigger breadth of landscape uh, rather than right now. It's just you know these buildings. We're going to make this web that goes over all of it, and then we're going to bring out the aquarium to make a new dunescape and new tidal pools. And this is the, the web. And this is looking at you know, marine life, the form of marine life, and then the form of the amusements at Coney Island, and say, how are these things going to actually be the same thing, grow together? And a lot of research on how fish skin works, because we wanted the web to do all the things, you know, filter, act as a, you know, the gills in some ways too. Um, so how, do, how does marine life actually operate? How do um, skins work? Um, you know, how do, what are all the different things that they do in terms of uh, protecting and communicating and filtering? And so the web really developed as this uh, amazing superstructure. Um, but 
that's the sort of science part of it, but there was so much um, of art involved in this, and this model actually was made by a, a dress designer. It's called not even fashion, it's a dress designer in Barcelona. So I think the way in which artists really participate in the work is critical. Uh, these are the skins, and then the lights. Uh, 40,000 um, solar-powered LEDs all over the web um, that uh, tell you also how, um, what the solar exposure is by the way they glow. And this is uh, what the web would look like. Um, this is before on top. This is what it looks like now, and this is what it would like look like when it's built. Unfortunately, this is not being built um, because a new director came in. Old director, you know what happens? It's a the old director's project. The new director happens to be a former student of mine uh, from Parsons, so it was kind of disappointing um, because he really was from inside and just thought we don't we need something practical. This is going to be a huge boondoggle. And I understood. What's interesting now is that he is possibly a board member for the Schillen Foundation. So all these things come around, fences get mended, um, and uh, places get made. So I want um, to end just saying it's not just expression, but this is reinvention, restoration, conservation, and regeneration of a place. So all of these things happen, and I think the best projects. Just ending on expression, And then on the book, which I really hope is just going to inspire people. It's actually not a monograph. It's a paperback to be used in courses by people like you. Um, and I really hope it inspires people to really follow their path and make their own checklists of how they want to do things and what really means a lot to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. off, um, but for those of you that want to stick around, um, Margie's happy to take a, a question or two. Yes. Yes. My town has been at a loggerheads and fisticuffs because we need a new school. And mm -hmm. we, need a new, we need a new school. We need to build a new K-8. Uh -huh. And the easy way through the town, fathers and some mothers think, is to take wild space, open space. Oh, okay. And I know. So there's a faction, of, a, a movement, to try and convince the town to, to reclaim space that's already been used to build up and to put a green roof on. There's a lot of preoccupation with something that's kind of red brick and sprawling with open fields, but we don't have the space for it. Are there resources, are there ways to help people get it so that what's wild is really wonderful? I would invite you to do one of the conservation workshops at the Schillen Foundation um, because I think this is a, an opportunity to actually look not at trying to separate these things but saying, what are the ways of building actually in a wild space that actually um, enhances and uses the wild space because it's not just a brick building plunked in? Um, and I do think in terms of scale, you know, it's critical. You might not be able to do it. It might be too big. Um, you might just blow out the space. However, I do think that there's an opportunity not to have two factions saying, don't build here. It's very McCargian to say, okay, this is the area you can mess up, and then this is the area you cordon off. So I think looking at sort of getting through that differently, but I would say to uh, maybe just look at a lot of precedents of buildings that don't totally threaten wild space, but actually work with them. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I loved hearing about it. So much of your work, okay, thanks. I, I loved hearing about your collaboration with artists and architects, and so much of your work involves water. I'm, I'll mm. confess, I'm a civil engineer, I do sustainable mm. stormwater. You haven't really talked about your collaboration with the engineers on this. I'm wondering if you could share some of that. Yeah, well, the question was, um, what's the collaboration with engineers? I actually feel like they're sort of like part of the pod. I mean, I feel, it didn't occur to me to mention engineers. I don't ever, I don't think I ever work without civil engineers, um, it's never the same ones. And I don't have an engineer, There's an engineer in Paris named Henry Bardsley, who I love, um, and I would work with him on anything. 
Um, but in terms of the people who actually are going to develop things and do the grading and drainage plans, which really have to be done by civil engineers and not by landscape architects. Um, so I, I collaborate with them, and, um, but the problem is the contracting. You can't always choose. Sometimes they're hired before you. It used to be, though, I was invited to the New Jersey DOT to give talks, and I was really the crazy lady talking about, you know, detention areas and stuff, and now it's, um, you know, they're way, way ahead of anything I could ever imagine. So I think that um, I love working with engineers now because it's basically we're all on the same page. I'm sorry not to have called them out. Yes? What do you think of the Rose Kennedy walkway? Boston. The question was, what do I think of the Rose Kennedy? I actually have to say that I haven't been there enough. Oh, you haven't? No, I mean, I've just seen pictures. I'm really hedging. <laughs> no, because I, I do think that you can't... My work photographs horribly because it is about being in the landscape, so I really think I would have to go there and be there. Can I return the question for you? And um, What do you think of the Rose oh, Kennedy walkway? Wow. <laughs> well, I have walked through it, and... It feels very good. I, in the nice weather, I see kids playing in the yeah. water, and it seems to be working. And I yeah. was just wondering. It look. It, it certainly looks like it works, but I really would have to be there and and really experience it. And I also don't really like. I, I just think I had a really a client who was an artist who I, we were talking about hydrangeas or something, and you know, are they good or are they bad? Somebody was saying to her, and she said, you know, there's no good or bad. I just think. I don't like to be an arbiter of what's good and what's bad. I mean, I could tell you some things that I think are really bad, but basically they're doing damage. So if it works and people love it, I think it's great. Can I ask the last question? Oh, sure. I'd love to know, how is it from English literature you found landscape architecture? What was the experience? Oh. It was really, really specific, and I can be really short. Um, I got out of college, and I'd gone to Bowdoin College with David Rosen over there, and we, um, I studied architecture, but th there was no major, and I actually loved it, but I didn't want to be an architect. I just thought, I don't want to design buildings, and I was doing all this site stuff and loved that. So I did what English majors do, and I went into publishing, and um, just to kind of get a job. And then I worked for Basic Books, and then I became a sales manager of Yale Press. Yale Press published The Common Landscape of America by John Stilgo, and I had to read all the books. And I was reading this book in bed, and I was like, oh my god, and I turned it over, he's, you know, teaches landscape architecture, and literally I quit my job. I called David, and I said, David, he was on the, doing the construction re restoration of Central Park, and I said, David, you gotta help me get a job and go to graduate school, maybe. So that was how it happened. What a fantastic story. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you.